This episode of Yesterworld is sponsored by Audible. Be sure to stay to the end of the video to hear about the title I'm currently enjoying and visit audible.com slash yesterworld or text yesterworld to 500-500 to receive one free audiobook and two free Audible originals when you begin your free 30-day trial. Wait, what the... The Unchanted Tiki Room? This has got to be a joke. Welcome to the Unchanted Tiki Room, which is definitely not a joke, but a new and more realistic overlay of the classic Walt Disney attraction. Okay, Jose, it's time to wake up. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we hope you've enjoyed the Unchanted Tiki Room. Have a magical rest of your day! Well, that was a mistake. Speaking of mistakes, how about we explore some of Disney's worst theme park blunders, from awful attraction overlays, doomed reimaginings, severe miscalculations, and everything in between. When it comes to short-lived Disney theme park attractions, Disneyland's original Tomorrowland has quite a few of them, such as the Viewliner Train of Tomorrow, which was essentially a precursor to the monorail that lasted just under two years. But one that lasted even less and was far more problematic were the Phantom Boats. Here visitors could pilot these stylish motorboats and cruise them around the lagoon unsupervised. However, this was back in a time when height requirements was as simple as can you reach the pedal, and much like the trackless Autopia, this led to a few incidents. The most common was thrill-seeking riders testing the maximum speed of their boat, but the poorly designed engine compartments often led to the motors overheating and shutting off, leaving guests stranded in the lagoon to be rescued. The solution was to have each boat piloted by a cast member, which solved the motor madness and speed demons from pushing the engine too far, but took a bit of the fun away and was far less popular. Just four months later, the Phantom Boats were decommissioned, and while they were supposed to be replaced by a far more thrilling airboats attraction, this never came to be. The Phantom Boats would return for a very limited time, but in the summer of 1956 were permanently closed, the first Disneyland attraction to hold that distinction. Or if you prefer a boat ride, you can cruise in a motorboat through Tomorrowland's winding waterways. White water ahead, so it shoot the rapids here. Unwilling to completely give up on a boat attraction, the concept was reworked as the Fantasyland motorboat cruise. This time, each boat could only go one speed, slow, and were confined to a hidden track under the water. Nevertheless, it seemed they finally got it right this time and was a big hit in the park's early years. But let's fast forward to the 1990s. In 1991, Fantasyland was taken over with Disney Afternoon Avenue, a celebration of Disney's entry into afternoon syndicated television. In addition to other activities such as meet and greets, a stage show, and what was basically a low-key test for Mickey's Toontown, there was motorboat cruise to Gummy Glen. You see, the 80s had seen a huge fall in the boat ride's popularity, due to the park's other, far more thrilling and better themed offerings. It didn't help that they got rid of the white water rapid section as part of New Tomorrowland in the 60s, which made it even less fun. So the Gummy Bears overlay was done as a last resort attempt to instill some life into the dying attraction. Now you'd have to be a true cynic to hate on this retheming too much but there's no denying just how incredibly cheap it was thrown together, and was obviously made purely for advertising the TV series. To no one's surprise, Gummy Glen did little to nothing to revitalize the attraction, and was seen for the cheap gimmick it was. Even more so than Rescue Rangers Raceway, which was another cheap overlay as an attempt to revitalize Fantasyland's Autopia. The reception of motorboat crews to Gummy Glen was so negative that this is what supposedly led to the historic attraction's closure in 1993.
It's hard to imagine today, but during construction of the Magic Kingdom in the 70s, the park's biggest competitor wasn't nearby rival theme parks, but the beautiful oceans and beaches of Florida. Which is precisely why Vice President of Park Operations Dick Nunes insisted on replicating the beach-going experience at the brand new Polynesian Resort. Now just for a little backstory, as there's a lot of confusion, Bay Lake was the name of the original body of water prior to the park. The Seven Seas Lagoon refers to the man-made portion in which Bay Lake is connected to, which may surprise you to learn is only about 14 feet deep. So it was during the initial digging of this future body of water that Dick Nunes had a beach shoreline built near the Polynesian and alongside the Seven Seas Lagoon. To complete the reproduced beachside experience, he also insisted they build a gigantic wave machine to simulate the crashing waves of the sea, and more importantly, for surfing. However, with a price tag of $400,000, or just over $2.5 million today, initially this was met with some resistance in the company. But it was actually Roy Disney of all people who was essential in getting the project greenlit, perhaps seeing the vision Dick Nunes had for a true Disney replicated beachside destination. So just before the lagoon was filled, the half a million dollar wave machine was built and installed at Beachcomber Island. It was then finally time to flood the Seven Seas Lagoon for the first and only time in the resort's history. The magic of Walt Disney World. A few months later, the park officially opened, and while the wave machine could easily be seen from both the Polynesian and traveling to the Magic Kingdom, it was already dead in the water, so to speak. You see, during the initial test before the park's opening, the wave machine worked more or less perfect, as can be seen in one of the rare photos of the intended result. Unfortunately, there were also quite a few problems. One of them was water erosion, which is a pretty common part of nature, but it's a little hard to predict with man-made shorelines and wave machines, and supposedly it was eating away very quickly at the beachfront. The powerful waves also resulted in quite a bit of turbulence issues with the lagoon's paddle boats, and had to be shut down each time they passed by. Finally, the wave machine also reportedly only worked a few hours at a time, before breaking down and requiring maintenance from engineers. Ultimately, with the new Disney Resort's $400 million cost, or $2.5 billion today, the priority was on recuperating their spending, not spending even more, as to properly fix the wave machine would have required the entire lake to be drained and filled back up again. So the half a million dollar wave machine was abandoned, and while the resort did see a number of water-based activities, it never quite became the true beachside experience as initially envisioned. We just finished with Mickey's Tropical Review. What a show. What a pampered way of life. Imagine your greatest South Seas fantasy, and Disney's Polynesian Resort makes it all come true. For over 15 years, the wave machine was left to rot at Beachcomber Island. That is until the late 80s to early 90s, when it was finally dismantled and removed. Even today, the former location of the wave machine is pretty easy to make out, and supposedly most, if not all, of the underwater parts are still rotting away underneath the lagoon. Much like the former wave machine over at California Adventure, but that's another story as part of an upcoming episode. Okay, so obviously the closure of almost any beloved Disney attraction could be seen as a mistake by their countless fans, especially in cases like Mr. Toad and Snow White's scary adventures at the Magic Kingdom. I refuse to get over this one, it was an amazing dark ride with so much history and unlike the others, wasn't turned into another attraction but a meet and greet. Ugh. Another was 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea in 1994, which we covered in a previous episode, but the Sparknotes version is that it was rumored to be replaced with a Jules Verne Volcania-based attraction. This evolved into a potential villain's mountain before the concept was moved over to Adventureland as a roller coaster based on Atlantis. This was called Fire Mountain and actually got pretty far into development before it was ultimately cancelled. However, we've yet to cover the very similar circumstances over at Disneyland. There is an expectation that we will be investing less in new stuff, at least uh, making sure that we are not drawing upon the company's cash, but beginning to return some of the cash. You see, the mid to late 1990s was a very troubling time at the Disney parks, and what's often referred to as the Paul Pressler era. 
Paul Pressler was the president of Walt Disney Attractions and was known for his unrelenting theme park budget cuts. After giving the axe to Mr. Toad and 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, he had what insiders called a hit list of his next targets. Now of these seven, obviously the Tiki Room is a pretty big what the f was he thinking, right next to Disneyland's submarine voyage. Thankfully, while the former never happened, despite an incident we'll be addressing later, unfortunately the latter would. In the infamous 1998 interview, when asked about the submarine voyage's future, he opted to neither confirm nor deny the rumors of its closure that fall. Fans were furious, but to avoid another Mr. Toad incident in which hundreds protested inside and outside of the park, Paul Pressler insisted that something even better was on the way. That something was a brand new attraction based off the upcoming animated feature film, Atlantis The Lost Empire. Now the true scale of this proposed attraction is up for debate, but at the very least, the plan was to incorporate both the submarine voyage and the nearby monorail. From here is where the story itself is also up for debate, but the facts are that on May 15th, 1998, a massive banner appeared on the submarine voyage's storage tunnel. To the excitement of many fans, it seemed to finally confirm the upcoming attraction, and while it's hard to tell in the photos, it was displayed on both sides of the tunnel. Additionally, based on eyewitness reports, a flag was also hoisted near the subs, and based on the descriptions, I've tried replicating it here. By the end of the day, the gigantic banner was removed, but oddly enough, the flag remained until the submarine voyage's official closure that September. So, what exactly happened? Well, some say there was a miscommunication between Disney management and the Imagineering department, and the go-ahead to announce this future renovation within the park was premature. The other and often more supported narrative is that the Imagineering team was so fed up with the cost-cutting measures of Paul Pressler that this was done in protest as basically a f**k <laughs> you to the higher-ups at Disney. They also allegedly put up posters like this on construction walls, hoping to put pressure on executives to greenlight the Atlantis expedition. Of course, Disneyland's Atlantis attraction, much like the Magic Kingdom's, never happened, and the lagoon was completely abandoned. However, in 2004, the submarines resubmerged for the first time in over six years as tests were underway, but not for an Atlantis-based attraction, but one inspired by Finding Nemo. The subs are back. Come live your dream with the all-new Finding Nemo submarine voyage, now resurfacing at the Disneyland Resort. Three years later, and almost ten years after its initial closure, Finding Nemo Submarine Voyage opened at Disneyland. So, happy ending, I guess? The Enchanted Tiki Room is one of the most beloved attractions at the Disney parks. From its close association with Walt Disney, to the revolutionary developments of audio animatronics, and of course its incredibly catchy tune. So when developing Disney's second theme park, The Magic Kingdom, it was a no-brainer decision to include it. Now it may surprise you to learn, as admittedly it did me when researching this episode, that Walt Disney World's version wasn't initially called the Enchanted Tiki Room, but Tropical Serenade. Minus the pre-show, the attraction was virtually identical and saw little to no changes in the park's early years. However, in the 1990s, Disney executives were looking for a way to spice things up a bit and update the experience. So with the absolutely massive popularity of both Aladdin in 1992 and The Lion King in 1994, it was decided to revamp this version of the Tiki Room with the film's most beloved characters, uh, supporting characters. The attraction closed in September of 1997 and reopened April the next year as the Enchanted Tiki Room under new management. The Enchanted Tiki Room is now under the zany new management of Yago and Zezu. Now the pre-show of this zany new attraction actually wasn't too bad, with legendary comedians Don Rickles and Phil Hartman as Morris and William, the agents of these mysterious new owners, which was a very subtle and hard to miss jab at the William and Morris Talent Agency. Wait, our clients are not here! Maybe they hit traffic. Don't say that! Sorry. Anyway, babe, I gotta fly this group and migrate back to Hollywood. My birds will call your birds. We'll do lunch. Then the main show began per usual, with the iconic Jose, Michael, Pierre, and Fritz doing their original back and forth, leading us into the beloved Tiki Tiki Room song. If we were not in the show, starting right away, I think the only...
Iago interrupts the song to inform the birds that him and Zazu are the new owners, and it's time that they get hip and change things up a bit. weren't bleeding after this first musical number with the angelic voice of Gilbert Gottfried, don't worry, they will, as the story continues when Iago angers the tiki gods by calling them wood for brain morons. Be careful, my fine feather little friend! When you mess with Polynesia, the tiki gods will squeeze ya! Now to be fair, the animatronic of the tiki goddess of disaster, uh, Oa, was pretty darn impressive. Too bad her song was pretty uninspiring. Iago is sent somewhere, and Zazu suggests that they let the Tiki Gods also have a turn at butchering the original with a 1950s doo-wop. <laughs> Now if your ears weren't bleeding before, they definitely are about to, as this is followed by an epic Tiki God rap. Iago returns, and unlike the audience with their foot halfway out the door, is won over by the last few musical numbers, and thus another pop song ensues. <laughs> Now if you're an intelligent person, you'd probably assume that since we got a Gilbert god-awful rendition of Friend Like Me, we'd also hear Hakuna Matata, right? Hakuna Matata? Hunky Tuna Tostana? What a stupid phrase! Nope, just another bad joke among the countless others I've taken the liberty of sparing you from. And just like that, the show's over. It may shock you to hear, but guests weren't too fond of under new management, with many calling it just plain insulting and one of the worst attractions in theme park history. Second worst attraction in theme park history. For 14 long and painful years, under new management lived on, until January 12th of 2011 when a mysterious fire broke out mid-performance. The true source of the fire, whether by accident or the work of a vigilante seeking justice for the original Tiki Room, has never, ever been revealed. So whether it was because of the high costs of rebuilding this version, or from the harsh reception and public criticism, or a combination of both, under new management was abandoned. Instead, Disney opted to restore the original version with a new title, Walt Disney's Enchanted Tiki Room. Thankfully, the one and only good thing about under new management was rescued, and now resides as an effect at the Polynesian Resort's Trader Sam's. But remember earlier when I vaguely spoke of an incident with the Tiki Room? Yeah, this wasn't it. Less than two years after the abomination opened at the Magic Kingdom, Disneyland's Enchanted Tiki Room was falling victim to Paul Pressler's earlier mentioned budget cuts. Ultimately, this cost-cutting practice came crashing down. Literally. As on January 8th of the year 2000, the pole supporting the entrance's A-frame collapsed on itself. Evidently, the cause of this accident was due to wood rot from its severe lack of upkeep. And aside from the obvious and negligent safety violations, this also affected the original Tiki Goddess Udi enclosed within the A-frame, and the historic location of the original Barker Bird. And while initially park management assured fans that she would be restored and reinstalled, Udi was essentially left to rot in a boneyard behind Pirates of the Caribbean. Allegedly, a mysterious cast member eventually pried the figure out of its canoe and took her home, leaving the rest to be thrown away. Sadly, the once iconic entrance was completely redesigned, and ultimately, at least in my opinion, ended up being far less impressive than the original. Now there are plenty of mistakes and blunders we could easily end the episode with, such as the abysmal superstar limo, or the horrendous journey into your imagination. But for this episode, I wanted to focus on the ones that are less covered, so let's talk about Star Tours at MGM Studios. How about you, Chris? CP2? Oh, yes, Master Michael. Thank you. <clears throat> I never get tired of that one. Just to rewind a bit, when the original Star Tours opened at Disneyland in 1984, it was a pretty big deal. 
so it was a no-brainer to also include the attraction at MGM Studios as well. However, unlike the Disneyland original, they weren't having to work within the confines of a previous attraction. So for MGM Studios' version, the entire section was transformed into one of the most impressive outdoor queues at the time. The main entrance and queue was an incredible recreation of the Ewok village from Return of the Jedi. For the nearby gift shop called Endor Vendors, they replicated the Imperial bunkers as also seen in the film, which gave it a great sense of continuity. It also had some pretty darn cool displays on the inside. But then this happened. You refer to the prophecy of the one who will bring balance to the Force. You believe it's this boy? In celebration and promotion of the first Star Wars movie in almost 20 years, Disney made the decision to finally bring a new destination to Star Tours, one that had been promoted since the attraction first opened, Tatooine. So MGM Studios' version of Star Tours was closed, and when it reopened in 1999, Tatooine was technically a new destination, but in the form of a gift shop. Okay, so I'm partially joking, as I'm sure no one really expected a new destination in the ride itself. But the problem is that the transformation of Endor vendors into Tatooine traders made absolutely no sense visually or geographically and ruined the aesthetic continuity of the set piece. On the inside, the once clever displays were replaced with more shelves to sell merchandise as part of the expansion. Tatooine Trader's confusing aesthetics remains to this day, but with the recent opening of its neighbor Galaxy's Edge, who knows what the future has in store? Get it? In store? Come on, it's a joke. But you know what isn't a joke? The incredible convenience of Audible. In case you haven't noticed, there are a ton, and I mean a ton of streaming services right now, and it's starting to become a little bit like a cable TV 2.0 situation. So it got me wondering about the origins and history of the one service that started the whole phenomenon in the first place, Netflix. That will never work, the birth of Netflix was right up my alley, as I absolutely love stories about ideas that to many seem crazy, but ended up changing the world, or more specifically, the entertainment industry. It's kind of like how everyone thought Walt Disney was crazy for making Snow White, believing no one would want to watch an animation for more than a few minutes at a time. Some even saying it might cause eye damage. So join me in listening to That Will Never Work Right Now with Audible's free 30-day trial, which includes one free audiobook and two free Audible originals. If you don't enjoy it as much as I am, swap it out for something else with no hassle. A while back, I finished listening to Bob Iger's Ride of a Lifetime and highly recommend it. Oh, and if you can't get around to one audiobook per month, no worries because your credits roll over every month. Just visit audible.com slash yesterworld or text yesterworld to 500, 500 And remember, every sign up supports the channel. Plus again, it's free, so you really have no excuse. As always, thank you all so much for watching. And if you haven't already, make sure to subscribe to the channel, hit that notification bell, like, share, and do all that fun stuff. And, and we'll see you next time in Yesterworld.